Welcome to Mega 10. I am Monica. And I am David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. You can also join the VIP front row to get early access to all our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and supporting us. All right, David, today's focus is Ripple's evolving architecture, how it might reshape the financial plumbing of the world. Not just a payment system anymore, but a universal liquidity layer connecting CBDCs, stablecoins, and tokenized deposits. Exactly. The conversation has moved far beyond just cross-border payments. Ripple's trajectory now sits at the intersection of central banking, tokenized assets, and AI-driven liquidity management. And if everything aligns, regulation, adoption, and trust, it could become the settlement backbone for program Money. What's fascinating is how this started as a cross-border messaging alternative, yet by 2025, it has transformed into a multi-layered institutional infrastructure. The XRP Ledger, Ripple Prime, and RLUSD now form what analysts call a plumbing stack, each layer serving a function, transaction finality, collateral, and liquidity routing. And that plumbing analogy isn't just a metaphor anymore. Central banks and the BIS literally describe cross-border settlement as a plumbing problem. Too many pipes, too many valves, different pressures. Ripple is effectively proposing a common valve that can regulate liquidity flow among CBDCs and stablecoins, with finality achieved in seconds instead of days. The idea of synchronizing CBDCs across jurisdictions is ambitious, though. Each central bank has its own design, some retail, some wholesale, some permissioned. But Ripple's architecture, particularly its interledger-based approach, can coordinate those systems without merging them. It keeps each ledger sovereign while synchronizing payment events. Right, and that's critical for trust. No central bank will give up monetary control, but they might agree to interoperable layers if those layers maintain compliance, privacy, and auditability. Ripple's record helps here. 12 years of continuous uptime on XRPL with deterministic settlement and institutional-grade finality. That's why BNY Wellen's role as RLUSD's reserve custodian matters so much. It signals that major custodians now view Ripple's infrastructure as safe enough for institutional reserves. RLUSD has grown past $900 million in circulation, fully backed by treasuries and bank deposits. And not just circulation, its usage pattern tells a story. NGOs like Water.org and Mercy Corps are already using RLUSD corridors to deliver aid. Settlements that used to take a week now clear in hours. That's a live proof that programmable liquidity can drive measurable outcomes, not just efficiency gains. It's like the beginnings of what people call impact-linked stablecoins, instruments that tie financial performance to social results. In these pilots, the settlement itself becomes the impact vehicle. For example, parametric insurance or disaster response disbursements triggered automatically through verified data. And that's where Ripple's design differs from generic stablecoin projects. It's not about speculative yield, it's about making value movement programmable and auditable at the same time. RLUSD isn't designed for DeFi farming. It's designed to behave like digital cash for institutions, with compliance baked in through features like clawback and deep freeze. The compliance architecture is impressive. XRPL's clawback allows asset issuers to retrieve tokens under legal orders, while deep freeze can restrict assets in response to sanctions or fraud. Those features make it compatible with regulatory frameworks that most blockchains struggle to meet. Which explains why multiple regulated stablecoins, USDC, XSGD, Europay, now coexist on XRPL. That diversity is proof that Ripple's ledger can handle tokenized money under real oversight. It's not a DeFi playground. It's a regulated infrastructure designed for cross-jurisdiction banking use. Yes, David, the big structural change came with Ripple Prime. The acquisition of Hidden Road turned Ripple into a full Prime broker, integrating custody, clearing, and settlement across digital and traditional assets. This is the piece that makes it look like an institutional back end, similar to Fedwire or Target 2, but built on blockchain. Exactly. Ripple Prime allows institutional institutions to trade, finance, and clear assets in one environment, with XRP and RLUSD as core instruments. Settlement finality within seconds, collateral managed on-chain, and capital freed from pre-funded Nostro accounts. That efficiency advantage alone could rewrite the economics of cross-border liquidity. Ripple's system also introduces integrated collateral management. XRP can act as the settlement asset for instant transfers, while RLUSD provides stable collateral for derivatives or margin. Together, they create a unified collateral pool that operates across asset classes. Which increases capital efficiency dramatically. Institutions can reuse collateral across FX, derivatives, and tokenized assets without waiting for multi-day reconciliation. That's a major improvement over fragmented traditional setups where each desk locks its own capital. 
the more I think about it, the more Ripple Prime resembles a hybrid between a payments network and a monetary infrastructure. But that raises regulatory questions. If it settles billions across jurisdictions, could it be classified as a systemic financial market utility? It's possible. Under Fiskox framework, a company becomes systemically important if its failure could threaten financial stability. Ripple's interconnectedness, custody, payments, and settlement fits that description once volumes reach certain thresholds. If RLUSD grows to tens of billions and Prime's assets surpass 100 billion, oversight by the Federal Reserve or ESRB becomes likely. And that might not be bad news. Systemic designation brings stricter rules, but it also confers legitimacy. It turns a fintech into recognized infrastructure, like CLS Bank or DTC. Ripple's own analysts seem aware of this and have prepared governance models that separate trading operations from settlement functions. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget, there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, David. Yes, structural separation is essential. It prevents conflicts of interest between proprietary trading and infrastructure management. And the proposals suggest a public interest board with representation from regulators and independent experts, similar to how clearinghouses operate. That would make sense if Ripple becomes part of the formal financial plumbing. But there's another layer, ISO 20222. As SWIFT fully transitions this month, every major cross-border system will use ISO 20222 messaging. Ripple's ability to map on-chain transactions to ISO fields could make it the natural settlement API for stablecoins. The timing couldn't be better. If Ripple Payments natively understands ISO 20022 structures, parties, purposes, compliance tags, banks can integrate without rewriting middleware. It means tokenized transfers could sit under the same regulatory data framework as fiat payments. That's interoperability at the semantic level, not just the technical one. And the benefit of that data richness is automation. ISO 2022 messages can carry structured metadata, allowing smart contracts to process payments automatically, invoice reconciliation, compliance screening, even yield distribution. Ripple's infrastructure can perform those actions directly because settlement and messaging are merged into one atomic action. It's like sending an ISO 20222 message that executes itself instantly in RLUSD with full auditability. But there's an inherent risk, concentration. If Ripple's system becomes too dominant, it could create dependency similar to what Swift has today, but controlled by a private company. True, and regulators are aware of that. The proposed safeguards include open source core algorithms, decentralized validator sets, and interoperability mandates requiring handoff to competing networks. In other words, Ripple can be powerful, but not unaccountable. The comparison to TCP IP always comes up here. The internet succeeded because its protocols were open and composable. Ripple seems to follow that philosophy a neutral layer for programmable liquidity where anyone can build on top. And like TCP IP, success depends on reliability, not hype. Ripple's promise of three to five second settlement means nothing if the network fails or if governance is opaque. The continuous uptime since 2012 helps build that credibility. Another angle is AI. Ripple's architecture is starting to integrate AI-driven routing within Ripple payments. Pathfinding algorithms already exist, but next-generation routing engines could optimize not just price, but also regulatory and liquidity parameters in milliseconds. Imagine an agent reading ISO 20222 messages, checking corridor liquidity, and choosing between fiat, RLUSD, or CBDC legs automatically. It's like a self-optimizing liquidity router. Oracle's new data nexus and AI database systems point exactly toward this kind of functionality. It makes sense. Liquidity moves faster than humans can decide. AI-driven engines can rebalance corridors, predict volatility, and allocate spreads dynamically. But transparency becomes vital. Regulators will need kill switches and explainable logic to ensure these algorithms stabilize rather than amplify volatility. That's why explainability frameworks are essential. AI can route funds efficiently, but without interpretability, it becomes a black box. Regulators won't allow that in systemic infrastructure. Ripple will likely integrate oversight dashboards so supervisors can audit routing decisions. The integration of AI also connects to another emerging idea, decentralized liquidity demons. These autonomous agents could monitor market stress and inject or absorb liquidity automatically. A decentralized stabilizer layer. Yes, it's conceptual now, but feasible. 
XRPL already executes deterministic logic at low latency. If agents can run predictive models and adjust pathfinding in real time, the network itself becomes adaptive, almost self-balancing. Though we must remember, automated stabilization carries systemic risks. Model drift, synchronized feedback loops, and opacity can all cause unintended turbulence. So while AI promises efficiency, it also demands prudential oversight. Agreed. AI doesn't remove the need for governance. It changes the shape of it. Supervisory algorithms might one day audit liquidity demons the way regulators now stress test banks. Now, stepping back, one of the most intriguing implications is monetary sovereignty. Emerging economies often rely on SWIFT and dollar settlement. Ripple's model could help them establish domestic CBDCs and regional corridors independent of Western intermediaries. That could redefine sovereignty itself. Instead of depending on foreign banks, regional blocks could operate shared settlement hubs on XRPL, controlling their own validators. It's a potential leveler for global finance, but it also introduces new dependencies on Ripple's technology. That's the sovereignty paradox, freeing from one dependency by adopting another. If emerging markets rely on private infrastructure, they must ensure local participation in governance. Ripple's open validator model allows that technically, but political will and technical capability remain challenges. A balanced approach would be regional cooperation, like ASEAN or the African Union, building collectively owned settlement layers using Ripple stack but under shared governance. It's similar to how Embridge functions under BIS coordination, though Ripple's system is more decentralized. Speaking of Embridge, the comparison is key. Embridge involves central banks in Hong Kong, Thailand, the UAE, and China. It's state-centric, permissioned, and requires diplomatic negotiation for expansion. Ripple's model, on the other hand, is open. Any central bank can issue a CBDC on XRPL and achieve instant interoperability. That flexibility could accelerate adoption, but it also raises questions about governance uniformity. Embridge trades speed for control, while Ripple trades control for accessibility. Each approach appeals to different regulatory cultures. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. The Basel III framework adds another layer of complexity. Banks must classify their crypto asset exposures under strict capital rules. And Group 1B applies to qualifying stablecoins, while Group 2 covers others. RLUSD likely falls under Group 1B, given its reserve structure and regulatory oversight, meaning banks could hold it with relatively low capital charges. That's a significant incentive. Lower capital requirements make RLUSD attractive for treasury operations. But once it becomes systemic settlement infrastructure, regulators might design a new category, systemically important settlement assets with zero or near zero risk weights, but heavy oversight obligations. Which would make RLUSD effectively equivalent to central bank money for settlement purposes, though privately issued. That's a huge shift, a private asset functioning like sovereign cash. Yes, and that's precisely why oversight frameworks must evolve. When private systems handle public functions, you need public interest governance. Structural separation, open standards, and regulatory visibility become non-negotiable. The potential efficiency is undeniable. By removing Nostro-Vostro pre-funding, institutions could free up $1 to $3 trillion in trapped capital. Imagine reinvesting that into productive markets instead of letting it sit idle in correspondent accounts. That's the real economic impact. Liquidity compression at scale means global trade and investment become cheaper and faster. It's not speculative. It's infrastructure efficiency. Yet, efficiency alone doesn't guarantee fairness. Without inclusive governance, the benefits could concentrate among large institutions. Ripple's open participation model, encouraging smaller financial providers in fintechs to run validators, could mitigate that. That's an important point. Decentralization isn't just technical. It's economic. A system where only a few nodes control liquidity would replicate existing inequalities. Ripple's challenge will be balancing institutional reliability with open access. Let's touch on humanitarian applications again. The RLUSD corridors used by Water.org and Mercy Corps already demonstrate what programmable aid can achieve. Direct disbursement, lower leakage, and faster delivery to those in need. It's transformative. Imagine sovereign aid programs built on similar rails. Governments could issue conditional transfers, for example, education stipends or health subsidies, settled instantly with full transparency. The same infrastructure serving corporate finance could empower social policy. But that also brings privacy concerns. Public ledgers can expose transaction data. 
Ripple's selective disclosure models, combining public verifiability with private data channels, might be the answer. It keeps oversight bodies informed without exposing individuals. Exactly. The balance between transparency and confidentiality is crucial, especially for humanitarian contexts. Technology can deliver both if designed correctly. Another thought, David. With Ripple integrating so deeply into global finance, could we see collaboration with asset managers like BlackRock or State Street beyond custody? Possibly. BYN Mellon already custodies RLUSD reserves. If BlackRock or State Street integrate tokenized funds through Ripple's network, XRP could shift from a utility token narrative to that of collateralized liquidity reserve. That would elevate its perception dramatically. And with Ripple Prime offering financing and clearing, RLUSD could serve as on-chain repo collateral, linking traditional money market funds and decentralized liquidity pools. Yes, tokenized repo is already mainstream through Broadridge's DLR and JP Morgan's Onyx platforms. Ripple could extend that ecosystem, allowing institutions to finance assets instantly with blockchain-verified collateral. It's striking how Ripple's components, RLUSD, Prime, Payments, and Custody, now resemble a vertically integrated stack for global finance. But integration also means concentration. Regulators will have to ensure it doesn't turn into a single point of failure. And that's why discussions around antitrust and interoperability are accelerating. Open APIs, public interest boards, and failover provisions will likely become mandatory if Ripple's scale keeps growing. Well said. Technology is proven. Governance will decide the outcome. If Ripple adopts transparent, multi-stakeholder oversight, it could become a model for public-private financial infrastructure. Continuing from that thought, the next milestone to watch is regulatory harmonization. ISO 2022 adoption across all major jurisdictions creates the data foundation for cross-chain interoperability. Once that's complete, Ripple can connect directly to legacy payment systems without translation losses. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. And globally, Prudential supervisors are already preparing for this hybrid environment. Also, the ESRB in Europe and FSOC in the U.S. are evaluating how to supervise private entities that operate systemic settlement utilities. Ripple is likely to be among the first test cases. That might even lead to a new classification, systemically important technology. The term is emerging in policy papers to describe tech infrastructures whose failure would ripple through financial stability, pun intended. That's fitting, because the more Ripple integrates CBDCs, stablecoins, deposits, the more it becomes invisible yet essential, like TCP IP under the internet. Nobody sees it, but everything relies on it. And that's the ultimate goal of good infrastructure, to disappear into reliability. When settlement becomes instantaneous, auditable, and safe, people stop noticing the pipes and start focusing on the flow. What's also fascinating is how Ripple's model blends public and private finance. Central banks retain sovereignty while private actors handle efficiency and innovation. It's a convergence of mandates that could reshape global monetary policy transmission. Absolutely. Tokenized corridors could even improve policy transmission by shortening settlement chains. But if corporates bypass banks entirely, we might see disintermediation pressures. Regulators will have to balance innovation with systemic protection. And if that balance is achieved, programmable liquidity could underpin a new kind of financial inclusion. SMEs and developing nations accessing liquidity instantly without relying on correspondent networks. That's the promise. Programmable liquidity doesn't just make finance faster, it makes it fairer, provided access remains open. Summing it up, Ripple's trajectory points toward a hybrid ecosystem, CBDCs providing sovereign backing, RLUSD anchoring private settlements, and Ripple Prime orchestrating liquidity across both. With AI routing, optimizing flows, ISO 20022 harmonizing data, and prudential frameworks ensuring stability. It's an end-to-end -end redesign of the world's financial plumbing, and it's unfolding right now. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. David and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable. Not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions. By the way, keep an eye on the global ISO 20022 enforcement phase in and the ongoing FSOC systemic infrastructure consultations. Both are shaping how platforms like Ripple will be supervised next year. See you next time.